One of the difficulties of conducting research on humans in terms of the impact of sleep deprivation on people's physiological and psychological well-being is ethical implications. The beneficence principle states that the benefits of research must outweigh the risks. Well, in the case of experiments with sleep deprivation, the risks to the individual in terms of their psychological and physiological harm outweigh the benefits gained. So much of what we know about sleep deprivation is based on experiments with rats, along with looking at various sleep disorders like insomnia or sleep apnea and looking at, again, the psychological and physiological effects of that along with isolated case studies of people who've, let's say, gone for records, sleep deprivation records, etc. In this clip, we're going to look at both the physiological and psychological effects of sleep deprivation. We'll talk about what happens when we have no sleep for three or four days plus. We're going to look at what happens when we're REM deprived in terms of REM rebound and also discuss microsleeps. The good news is about partial sleep deprivation in particular is that the symptoms are temporary and generally will return fairly rapidly to a optimal level of psychological and physiological functioning once we get back into our normal sleep routine and get an adequate amount of REM. But it's important that you understand the difference between psychological and physiological symptoms of sleep deprivation. So when we're talking about psychological symptoms, think about in cognitive impairments such as our ability to perform cognitive tasks, lack of concentration, impaired memory processes, reduced memory span, etc. Also think about things affecting our well-being. So for instance, lack of motivation, more anxious, moody, etc. Hallucinations. We're not going to suddenly start hallucinating after, let's say, losing a few hours sleep on the weekend because we have a big night out. Hallucinations is something that's a symptom of chronic sleep deprivation as indicated by case studies of people who've say gone for sleep records, no sleep for 11 days plus etc where they literally start having those sensory distortions after three or four days. An interesting one is studies done by Deaconson in particular on the impact of sleep deprivation on our cognitive performance and studies have shown that when we are sleep deprived and we do a boring, monotonous task, there'll be a significant decline in our performance. But when we're doing a engaging, interesting task, it, sleep deprivation tends not to affect our performance, which is good news, let's say, if we had a bad night's sleep the night before the psychology exam because we're motivated, because we're engaged, that should not affect our performance on that interesting cognitive task. There are some obvious physiological effects of sleep deprivation, such as fatigue, sleepiness, aches and pains, increased sensitivity, along with some additional symptoms once we become chronically sleep de deprived, such as a noticeable reduction in body temperature after, say, two or three days of no sleep. The immune system starts to function less efficiently, etc. And death in extreme cases, as based on experiments done with rats where they've been totally sleep deprived for days on end. In terms of the impact of sleep deprivation on our physiological and psychological well-being, well this links into the restorative theory of sleep and I've already done a clip on this. So a reduction in REM sleep is going to result in psychological and cognitive impairment whereas a reduction in non-REM sleep the symptoms are going to be more physiological as we indicated on the previous slides. Now remember with our sleep cycles that our REM episodes get longer and longer with each sleep cycle and each sleep cycle goes for 90 to 100 minutes. So most of our REM is after those first couple of sleep cycles. So if we wake up in the middle of the night and we don't go back to sleep then we've missed out on the vast majority of our REM. So what will happen is the next night we will experience REM rebound. And there's two things to observe when we are discussing REM rebound. Number one is it'll take us less time to actually go into REM sleep. But importantly, 
we will still have our non-REM sleep. So for instance, we'll still go through stages one, two, three, and four of non-REM, then back into three, two, one. And then instead of having our usual sort of five minutes of REM in that first sleep cycle, we might have 20 minutes of REM. So again, importantly, A, we're gonna get there quicker in terms of experiencing REM, and we'll have proportionally more, up to double. So instead of having a usual hour and a half, two hours of REM sleep, you might have double that, depending on how much REM you've been deprived of in, in the previous nights. Microsleeps are more likely to occur when we're sleep deprived, and oversimplifying it to a degree, it's where parts of our brain are asleep. So we've got this reduced awareness of our internal state and external environment, therefore satisfying the criteria for an altered state of consciousness. But other parts of our brain are still apparently awake. So it appears as if the person is in fact awake. It lasts for a few seconds to a couple of minutes and an EEG would show a brainwave pattern that would resemble that of a light sleep. So a combination of alpha and theta brainwaves, lower frequency and higher amplitude in comparison to a normal waking consciousness.